Hey there and welcome back to Mass Effect 2. My name is Pete and today we complete our first tour of the new Normandy as we get to know our ship and its crew, collect a few more codex entries and unlock another achievement. I have also read all of your comments regarding the audio levels in the last two episodes, so in this one the in-game dialogue will hopefully be on the same levels as my commentary. And with that being said, let's jump in. In the last episode, we were handed a brand new ship, the Normandy SR2, and today we'll get to know that ship, starting with our very own private terminal. The team status and upgrades are not really all that interesting at the moment, because we're still at the very beginning of the game, but we already have some messages, so let's have a look at those. The first one here is from Admiral Anderson, formerly known as Captain Anderson, who writes the following. On the off chance that the rumors are true and you actually are alive, I need you to come and talk to me on the Citadel. A lot has changed in the last two years. You put us on the council and it's only fair that you be allowed to speak for yourself about what we've been hearing. So rumors have apparently made the round already and we will definitely visit the Citadel soon. After all, the council might be able to help us against the collectors. Reading this message here, by the way, also unlocks another codex entry, number 7 of this playthrough. The next message here then comes from Admiral Hackett and it is part of the very first DLC I have installed. Now, for the first few hours of the game we will mainly play without any of the DLC. This one right here, however, marks an exception. Hackett writes, Our scans in the Amada system have turned up something we thought you should see. The final location of the wreckage of the SSV Normandy. We thought this news might be important to you, but we also have an ulterior motive. The Alliance would like to honor the Normandy with a monument to be built on the site of the ship's final resting place. We'd like to invite you to place the monument and be the first to walk on the site. There are still 20 crew members unaccounted for from the attack on the Normandy. If you find any signs of these lost crewmen, we ask that you report to the Alliance so that those heroes' families might find some closure. Godspeed to you, Commander. Now, considering that Anderson had only heard rumors about Shepard being alive, it might seem somewhat strange to receive this message from Hackett. For the moment, let us just assume that Hackett has received a bit more information a bit earlier. After all, Shepard will make his presence known in the galaxy soon enough. Now, up next we will unlock the first achievement of this episode, which is the Highly Trained Achievement, which will be unlocked after watching all three of these advanced combat training videos. The videos explain the basics of controlling combat in the game. At this point, however, we should be familiar with that, so I have cut that out, but believe me, I've watched them all. And here we are, with the Highly Trained Achievement unlocked. Welcome aboard, Commander. I'm Yeoman Kelly Chambers. I've been assigned as your administrative assistant. I'll manage your messages and help you monitor the crew. And I must say, it's such an honor to work under you, Commander Shepard. Well, Miss Chambers here goes for the friendly approach, and I think we should do the same. At this point, though, there are no morality points to be had. I'm glad to have you on the team, Miss Chambers. Please, call me Kelly. And it is actually important that we accept that offer here, otherwise we won't have access to two Paragon points later on in the conversation. Okay, Kelly. Anything else? Now, Kelly introduced herself as our administrative assistant, so maybe she has already collected information that we should be aware of. Is there anything I should know? Joker would like to speak to you on the bridge. Anything else, Commander? Alright, we'll make a note here to talk to Joker up next. For the moment, though, we can try to get to know Kelly a bit better. Do you have a moment to talk? I always have time for you, Commander. And our first question here is the obvious one. Let's learn a bit more about what Kelly's duties on board of the Normandy actually are. What are your responsibilities? I'll keep you notified of any messages or appointments you might have. If any of the crew has important business to discuss, I'll make sure you know. All of that sounds like typical assistant work, and in the day and age of Mass Effect, of course, begs the question why it's not automated. Isn't that the type of task better suited for a VI? Yes, but being your yeoman is just my official role. Unofficially, I observe the crew. Everyone knows how risky our mission is. Many of us may not be coming back. That's a lot of pressure. I have a degree in psychology. I'm good at sensing when people are overly taxed. Okay, interesting. So she's also an unofficial observer. Admittedly, though, the goal of her COVID observation seems to be noble. You make sure the crew's mental health is sound? Yes. I look for warning signs. I listen. It's not a full-time job, and it's most effective when done informally. And yes, while from an ethics perspective this is certainly questionable, especially for someone like me who works in research himself, the circumstances here are definitely different, so let's make her feel welcome. After all, it sounds like we need to be able to trust her. We're lucky to have someone with your skills, Kelly. Thank you, Shepard. What else would you like to know? Up next, we can then ask about her current situation, which is, of course, pretty unique, and understandably, working on a ship like this might not be for everyone. How do you feel about being assigned to the Normandy? I was handpicked by the elusive man to help fight the greatest threat known to humanity. How do I feel? Honored, exhilarated, 
terrified, but mostly I feel encouraged. Under your leadership, we can't fail. Nice to see that she puts her trust in us, and let's reassure that notion. We don't need people questioning us before the journey has even begun. Don't worry. We'll defeat the Collectors. I trust you implicitly. The moment I met you, I knew I could close my eyes, fall back, and you'd be there. Okay, time to get a bit romantic here. Admittedly though, Kelly started the whole thing, but even though Shepard is still technically with Liara, we can get away with a bit of flirting at this point, and Shepard has been very lonely for the last two years, so let's go with it, just because we can. I might do more than catch you, Kelly. Now that's an enticing thought. Anything else you'd like to talk about? And last but not least, we want to make sure to ask her about her opinion of Cerberus, as this will eventually allow us to gain a few more morality points. This organization has a dark reputation. Do you have any concerns working for them? Not at all. Our methods can be harsh, but Cerberus has noble objectives. We look out for human interests, advance human technology, save human lives. They're good goals. Easy to notice is of course the exclusive focus on humanity, which could indicate that alien races are not held in high regard. It sounds like Cerberus wants to dominate all aliens and put humankind on top. Cerberus looks out for humanity, but that doesn't mean we hate aliens. My sister started a dog shelter, but she loved cats too. I love humanity. I also love Asari, Quarian, Turian, Salarian, Hanar. That isn't in conflict with Cerberus ideals. And at this point right here, we can now get the first two Paragon points of the episode, and the corresponding dialogue option is only available if we agree to call her Kelly, otherwise we would be left with only the Renegade choice. That's a very positive attitude. What can I say? I'm a people person. Anything else you'd like to talk about? And no, that's it for the moment, but don't worry, we will have more talks with her in the future. I better go. Okay, maybe we'll talk later. Alright, here we now receive our two Paragon points, and Kelly did mention that Joker wants to talk to us, so let's make our way over to the cockpit. On the way, we can collect Codex entries number 8 and 9, number 8 can be gained by examining the controls on the right side here, and number 9 is collected after examining the flight controls just a few meters up ahead. Can you believe this, Commander? It's my baby! Better than new! It fits me like a glove! And leather seats! Military may set the hardware standard, but on a first-gen frigate, they could care less if the seats breathe. Civilian sector comfort by design. The reproduction is not intended to be perfect, Mr. Moreau. Seamless improvements were made. And there's the downside. I liked the Normandy when she was beautiful and quiet. Now she's got this thing I don't want to talk about. It's like ship cancer. Right, we are going with the option in the middle, because what will be said in a few seconds is a fair bit different from what is written here. Of course, at this point, I don't think Shepard is already trusting Cerberus, but he should have realized by now that his options at the moment are somewhat limited, and this option in the middle reflects that quite well, I think. Enjoy it, Joker. If we're stuck here, we might as well let them pamper us. Uh, does it breach uniform regs if I get that on a cruise shirt? Because this is my favorite, you have no choice, choice ever. Technically, this is a civilian ship. I'm probably lucky you're still wearing pants. Yeah, I'll save that for the off-hour cameras. Have an AI watch me 24-7. Cheers. And speaking of that ever-watchful AI, we have only been briefly introduced yet in the last episode, so let us now have our first full conversation with Edie. Yes, Shepard. And to get in rhythm, let's start with the question that we will ask Edie a bunch more times in this episode, and have her explain to us what exactly this area of the ship is. What's this area of the ship? This is the bridge, where the navigator plots our FTL vectors, and the helmsman maneuvers the ship. Yeah, sitting right here, thanks. Now that we've got that out of the way, however, let's learn a bit more about our AI companion. I want to know more about you. Do you have a specific inquiry? And let's begin by asking about the name. I believe this was already briefly explained in the last episode, but after all, this is a completionist playthrough. Why are you named Edie? Edie is the phonetic pronunciation of E-D-I. That is an acronym for Enhanced Defense Intelligence. Alright, good to know. Much more interesting, however, where is that intelligence actually located? After all, there has to be some sort of hardware behind Edie, and that is very likely located on this ship. Where are you? My core intelligence is housed in a quantum blue box located behind the medical bay. Okay, so we'll have to check that out in a moment as well. Let's stay with Edie for a while longer though, and ask her about her, well, working relationship with our pilot Joker. How are you getting along with Joker? Mr. Moreau does not trust me. It offends him that I am installed aboard his ship's computers. Yeah, the last Normandy did just fine without an AI reminding me the airlock is ajar. And while we're on the topic of Edie reminding Joker of things, let's also ask the obvious question now. What exactly is Edie's purpose on this ship? What do you do aboard the ship? 
I operate the ship's electronic and cyber warfare suites in combat. My reaction time is much faster than any organic. I collate the records of shipboard monitoring devices for the elusive man. I serve additional functions which are restricted at this time. Okay, that sounds pretty useful already. And let's also ask about those additional functions. Maybe Edie has a lot more in store for us than she just revealed. Restricted functions? Like what? I do not know. Some of my databases are sealed. Some of my hardware is kept offline. I assume that when certain unknown conditions are met, those functions will be released to me. Alright, looks like we have no other choice but to wait and see what those functions actually are. However, as of right now, Edie also mentioned monitoring devices, and that strikes me as a potentially intriguing topic. The elusive man has monitoring devices on board? He has invested most of Cerberus's resources into the design and construction of this ship. He has an interest in monitoring our progress. Fair enough, that seems like an at least somewhat reasonable point. So let's ask about one more function that Edie mentioned, and that was cyber warfare. Cyber warfare means things like viruses, right? In close-range ship-to-ship combat, I can sometimes break through the firewalls of an enemy's internal wireless network. Once I seize control of their systems, I can turn off gravity or air. I can disable weapons guidance or shields, or I can put their fusion plant in meltdown. On the defense, I manage Normandy's own suite of jammers, decoys, and internal firewalls. And yes indeed, that does sound impressive, although it of course raises the question why those features are not a lot more common. Sounds incredibly useful. Why is there someone like that on every warship? An organic operator cannot react quickly enough to changing circumstances or perform the necessary multitasking. This is a role that can only be filled by an artificial intelligence. Unfortunately, we are suspect. Or well, might have something to do with how an AI almost destroyed galactic civilization, just putting it out there. And with that, we have now exhausted our dialogue options regarding ED. However, there are still a few more questions to ask. Let's discuss something else. Ready. The last option here concerns Cerberus itself, and I imagine, being an AI developed by Cerberus, ED should have a few interesting pieces of information. I want to know more about the people I'm working with. Much of that data is classified. Do you have a specific inquiry? And we will start with the basics. We have already met the elusive man and a few of Cerberus's operatives, but the overall structure of Cerberus is still largely unknown to us. How is Cerberus organized? Aside from the elusive man, I don't see much chain of command. Cerberus is organized into task-oriented cells. Each operates in isolation. Members from one cell cannot recognize the members of another. Each cell's agents are led by a single operator. We are called the Lazarus Cell, which is directed by Operator Lawson. This now at least shines a bit more light on Miranda's role within Cerberus, even though we still don't know how big Cerberus as a whole really is. So how many operations is Cerberus running right now? I have a block that prevents me from answering that question. And of course, we want to investigate that block further, maybe also to learn how we can access that information in the future. What do you mean? Although I am less controlled than other AI, I am still subject to behavioral blocks and the physical isolation of my hardware. In this case, I am prevented from truthfully answering your question by Cerberus's levels of secret classification. This now also makes it highly unlikely that Edie is going to tell us anything about Cerberus's resources, but let's ask about it anyway. What sort of resources does Cerberus have? Money, personnel, facilities? I have a block that prevents me from answering that question. And that answer was to be expected, and I have a feeling the same will be true if we ask for further information regarding the building process of the Normandy. How did Cerberus replicate the most advanced warship in the Alliance Navy without anyone knowing? I have a block that prevents me from answering that question. Okay, seems like we have quite literally hit a block here with Edie, as this seems to be all the information we can get for the moment. That's all for now. Logging you out, Shepard. However, we're not done just yet, because we can have a second conversation with Joko right away. Commander. And to start things off, we'll ask about the situation in the cockpit, which is probably a bit less quiet than Joko's used to. I assume everything is going well up here? I really want a chance to put the Normandy through her paces. I just have to trim up the drive output and it'll be like we never lost her. Safety standards advise against manipulating drive settings while engines are powered and in use, Mr. Moreau. Commander, can we shut this thing off? I don't need it in my day to day. And while I can certainly sympathize with Joker here, I'm afraid we have no other option but to tell him that he'd better get used to ED. I'm no fan either, but we're stuck with it. Until I find a soldering gun. There's gotta be some wires I can cross to make it hurt. No sabotage. Understood? Yeah, yeah, don't break the boss's toys. And now, in this second conversation, we have access to the Investigate dialog tree, and this gives us a lot more to talk about. For example, we can reminisce about the good old days. Ever think about the old Normandy and the trouble we got up to? 
Yeah, those seem like the good old days now, but come on, it was hell at the time. Geth, Saren, Sovereign, and then we got dumped. We're stuck in a weird place, sure, but back then it wasn't all sunshine and bunnies. While that might be true, we certainly had a pretty decent squad back then. And apart from an AI in the cockpit, that might actually be one of the biggest changes for Joker. What happened to the rest of the old crew? I heard most survived. Almost did. Presley didn't. And the rest of us just sort of drifted apart. The Alliance didn't care. I don't think they liked all the non-humans in your crew. We were your team, Commander. With the Normandy destroyed and you gone, there wasn't much keeping us together. And while we're on the topic of the crew, it certainly looks like we are on a good way towards building a new team, so let's ask him for his opinion on the personnel we have picked up so far. What do you think about the people we're picking up? Well, about the ones you went out with last, I would never say anything against Miranda and expect to survive the reprisal. Jacob is way too nice a guy for the number of ways he knows how to kill people. It's just my opinion, though. There's really no need to go spreading it around. And while we allow Joker to speak his mind, we might as well ask about the situation as a whole. So, how do you think we're doing? Well, the Normandy's not as ready as she could be. There's always more we could upgrade. And as for the crew, you'd have to ask a, a people person. Well, good thing we have just talked to a self-declared people person. So, for the time being, it seems like Joker himself has nothing more to add. That's it for now. See you, Commander. Alright then, that concludes our business in the cockpit. The tour of the ship, however, has only just begun. Our next stop is now the Armory on the right side of the galaxy map, where we can get a quick look at how weapon management works in Mass Effect 2, and where we can also have a short conversation with Jacob. What's this area of the ship? This is the Armory, where small arms are maintained and upgraded. Using Omnitool, computer-aided design and manufacturing, we have the capability to manufacture several new models. And using the weapons locker here, we could now in theory change the weapons loadout for every single of our squad members. At the moment though, since we don't have any of the DLC installed, we have nothing else available apart from the default starting weapons. So at this point, we can't make any changes. We can see, however, that other than in Mass Effect 1, our squad members are somewhat limited in their weapon choices, as both Jacob and Miranda only have access to two different types of weaponry. Like I said though, at the moment we can't make any changes, so we'll bother with the whole equipment thing at some point down the line. For now, let's talk to Jacob. Commander, there hasn't been time to really settle in and take stock. I want to say that working with you is a great opportunity to do something that matters. It's a privilege to serve on the Normandy, Commander. And we have been pretty friendly with him so far. At this point, however, we could get two Renegade points for free. There is no Paragon option that we could choose here, so let's make it very clear why exactly Jacob is here. You're here because you're Cerberus. Don't expect special treatment. Understood. But not everyone in the group is hardline. I'm an employee because I believe in their current direction. Doesn't mean I don't have concerns about their past actions. Or some of yours. You watch me, I'll watch you. That suit you? That sounds like a very reasonable approach. Before we tell him that though, it might seem like a good idea to ask which Cerberus actions exactly he was talking about. What has Cerberus done to make you nervous? A lot. They've been called terrorists, and with good reason. Doubt you can find a more checkered past. But if the Collector threat is real, and we do something about it, Cerberus will be remembered differently. Or we'll all be tried and executed. Can't count on people thinking about it as hard as I have. And now we can also make up for the two Renegade points from earlier, by selecting either one of the top two options here. And to be honest, Jacob's straightforwardness is somewhat refreshing, which is why that is the option we choose. It's good to hear a clear opinion. Sounds like we're two of a kind. That honors me more than you, Commander. Let me know if you need anything. And here we are, we get two Renegade and two Paragon points, and so we can now move on and have Edie tell us a bit more about the briefing and communications room. What's this area of the ship? This is the FTL communications room. In addition to interfacing with the FTL comm network, Normandy is fitted with a quantum entanglement communicator linked to the elusive man's office. This allows lag-free communication even when you operate off the comm grid. And yeah, that whole quantum entanglement thingy, that probably needs a bit more explaining. I've never heard of a quantum entanglement communicator. How does it work? Essentially, two subatomic particles are created in an entangled state. One is installed here, and the other in the elusive man's office. When one particle occupies a given quantum state, its entangled partner will always enter the opposite state, no matter the distance between them. If we alter the state of our particle, that alters the state of the elusive man's. This allows us to send data in the form of quantum bits. 
And indeed, that sounds very useful, which once again raises the question why only we are using them. Why aren't these used everywhere? Each quantum pair costs nearly as much as a comm relay, and can pass only one quantum bit of data at a time. In addition to the cost and bandwidth issues, the system is strictly point to point. To contact a hundred different worlds, we would need to manufacture and install a hundred entangled pairs, one link to each world. Understood, that makes a lot of sense, and also tells me that we are going to hear from the elusive man sooner rather than later. That's all for now. Logging you out, Shepard. And through the armory we can now make our way back to the main deck, from where we can, for the first time in this playthrough, use the elevator, but of course not before getting a bit more information from Edie. What's this area of the ship? This is the Combat Information Center. Here, the crew receives sensor data and coordinates gunnery and damage control efforts. While Normandy is flown from the bridge, during combat the commanding officer issues orders from the CIC. Alright, and now we can use the elevator and we'll go down one level, which will bring us to the cruise quarters. Stepping out of the elevator, we can first head left and receive a snide remark about entering the women's restroom. Shepard, the men's restroom is on the port side of the ship. Before we can then listen to a short conversation between oh, two of our crew members. How old? Ah, uh, she'll be a year old next month. Oh, you'll miss her first birthday. Wow, my family lives in New Canton. Oh. Uh, that colony's on the edge of the frontier. Could be vulnerable to collector attack, couldn't it? Exactly. It's most important that she have a first birthday. That's why I'm here. This, by the way, a fantastic addition in Mass Effect 2. There is a lot more ambient dialogue in the game, which makes the whole game world feel a lot more alive. Access to life support is restricted. As we just heard, life support can't be accessed at the moment. The men's restroom also looks exactly like the one we were in before, so let's leave that behind and continue down this side of the ship, which leads us to the office of Miranda Lawson. Commander, what can I do for you? And as we have done with everyone we have met so far, we are also asking Miranda what her duties are on board of the Normandy. What exactly are your duties, aside from keeping an eye on me? I'm the elusive man's agent. You're his most important asset. My job is to make sure you succeed. Aside from that, I send regular reports to the elusive man, updating our status. And this now perfectly leads over to the next question, what exactly is our current status? Anything I should know regarding the Normandy? The crew's working well, and the ship appears to be performing to specifications. That is certainly good to hear, and because it looks like we have no big issues to talk about, let's try once again to ask Miranda a few personal questions. You have a minute, Miranda? No doubt you've got a lot of questions. Cerberus isn't as evil as most people believe. If I can help allay any of your concerns, I'd be happy to do so. So, what would you like to know? And as always, it is very important to go with the investigate dialogue options here first, otherwise they will vanish and no longer be available. We can ask quite a few questions here about Cerberus, and let's start things off with the most basic one. Of course, we had our run-ins with the organization before. Right now, we are working for or at least with them. In the end, though, we still don't really know what they are exactly. Are you military or political? Or both? Cerberus has several divisions. Political, military, scientific. But we're all working towards the same goal. The teams you encountered before your... accident were mostly part of our military division. But not all Cerberus operations use the same protocols. We try not to get bogged down in bureaucracy or formality. So Miranda mentioned that they are all working towards the same goal, and I would imagine that goal is a bit more than just to defeat the Collectors. I know what we're doing here, but what's Cerberus's long-term goal? The advancement of the human race. Nothing more, nothing less. The Salarians have the Special Tasks Group. The Asari have their legendary commandos for stealth and recon operations. Cerberus is humanity's answer to those organizations. But those organizations are regulated by governments. Who keeps Cerberus in check? Nobody. We're privately funded and our backers trust the elusive man to make the right decisions. But he's very clear about our goals. Protect humanity and serve its advancement. And since Miranda just mentioned the elusive man, we might as well ask about him too. It is not unlikely that she knows a lot more about him than we do. What can you tell me about the elusive man? Not much that you don't already know. Even I don't have access to most of his background. And you've seen more of him than most ever do. It's rare for him to become directly involved in missions, but you're something special. Whatever else people might say about him, I can assure you he's got humanity's best interests at heart. That includes you and me. How can you be sure of that if you know so little about him? I didn't get to where I am without knowing how to gauge people's motives and ambitions, even from brief encounters. He's no saint, and he'd be the first to admit it. But he is committed, 
Humanity couldn't have a better advocate. Now, earlier on, Miranda also mentioned that Cerberus is privately funded, and since Edie already wasn't much of a help in this regard, maybe Miranda can shed a bit more light on the amount of funds we're talking about here. What kind of resources does Cerberus have? We're very well funded, though I doubt anyone other than the elusive man knows exactly how well. But our resources aren't unlimited. Reviving you and rebuilding the Normandy was a significant investment, and a significant risk. We're all hoping you can do the impossible, Shepard. No pressure. And with that, we have now exhausted all of the investigate options, which means it is time to get a bit more personal. Tell me about yourself, Miranda. Oh, I guess that's fair. I've spent the last two years learning everything there is to know about you. Well, you should probably know that I've had extensive genetic modification. Not my decision, but I make the most of it. It's one of the reasons the elusive man handpicked me. I'm very good at just about anything I choose to do. And of course, it is the obvious question at this point. Genetic modification, that can mean pretty much anything. Let's see if she can get a bit more specific. What level of genetic modification are we talking about? That's very thorough. Physically, I'm superior in many ways. I heal quickly and I'll likely live half again as long as the average human. My biotic abilities are also very advanced. For a human. Add to that some of the best training and education money can buy and... Well, it's pretty impressive, really. It certainly sounds like it, and yes, at this point it even seems like Miranda has no weaknesses whatsoever. Sounds like you were designed to be perfect. Maybe, but I'm not. I'm still human, Shepard. I make mistakes like everyone else. And when I do, the consequences are severe. Everyone expects a lot from someone with my... abilities. Well, at least we don't have to worry about Miranda underestimating herself. Her description here sounded more than confident in her own abilities. You certainly don't lack for confidence. It's just a fact. My reflexes, my strength, even my looks, they're all designed to give me an edge. No point in hiding from it. It's the reason I'm trusted to oversee the most dangerous, risky and technically demanding operations Cerberus undertakes. And it's why I was assigned to you. It's my job to make sure you succeed, Shepard. Well, we can only hope that she will be successful in that job. For the moment, though, the conversation has come to an end and we can leave again. Thanks for the information, Miranda. I'll talk to you later. Of course, Commander. Whatever you need. Chef surprise again? Come on, Rupert. I'm sorry, Princess. Filet mignon and caviar coming right up. Let me just get out my doilies. That'd be real nice, Mr. Gardner. And here we immediately have the next person we can talk to, Mess Sergeant Gardner. Commander Shepard, the hero of the Citadel. You did humanity proud that day. Miss Sergeant Rupert Gardner here. How can I be of service? Well, let's immediately turn that question around and ask how we can be of service. The conversation we just overheard sounded like the crew was complaining about food variety. You have everything you need. I make do, but have you ever tried to prepare a decent meal with military provisions? I'm good, but I'm no miracle worker. Taking down the collectors is going to be rough business. The crew deserves a few fine meals before they throw themselves into the fire. And while there are certainly bigger issues, that does not automatically mean that we cannot try to help, so let's ask what we can do for the man. What do you need? If I had some quality ingredients... Oh shit. You've got more to worry about than grocery shopping on the Citadel. Forget I mentioned it. And this is actually the first small quest we can pick up here, so we definitely want him to give us that list. We will at some point visit the Citadel anyway. We might as well take a quick detour. If I head that way, I'll keep an eye out. Much appreciated. Most of this list is probably standard fare for those namby pambies on the Citadel. Anything else you'd like to talk about? And now we have reached that usual point that we've had in almost every conversation so far. Let's ask Gardner about his job here on board. What do you do here on the Normandy? What don't I do? Most think of me as the ship's cook, but I'm also the facilities technician and custodian. HVAC, plumbing, non-mission critical electrical, I make sure they're all clean and running. So the man cleaning the toilets is also preparing the meals. I wash my hands. Most of the time. This ain't no luxury liner. You have to pull your own weight in a Cerberus vessel, and I catch what falls through the cracks. <laughs> through the cracks. And working for Cerberus, he might also have some thoughts on the organization. And I think, especially in our position, it never hurts to hear another perspective on things. How do you feel about working for Cerberus? Damn proud. Cerberus gets the job done. The Alliance and Council have got their heads buried so deep up their butt puckers they can't see squat. 
It'll take good old human ingenuity to crush these collector vermin. Only Cerberus knows that. So it certainly looks like Gardner has absolutely no reservations about working for Cerberus. And who knows, maybe that also ties into his reasons for why he joined the organization. How did you find your way into Cerberus? Can you believe I was once a family man, working the Ezo rigs along the frontier? I was happy enough, but losing everything to Batarian raiders can change your outlook. I needed to make a difference. I'm no soldier, but I've got skills, and Cerberus keeps an eye out for talent. I'll do whatever it takes to help. Be that plumbing a sewer, routing an air duct, or keeping everyone's bellies full. Okay, even though we might not agree with his opinion about Cerberus, it certainly seems like he has the right mindset, which is also why I think we can do him a favor and help him bring a bit more variety to the meal table. I won't take any more of your time. Back to work. Alright, and here we now receive the Find Ingredients assignment. For the moment, the pathway down the hall here also doesn't lead us anywhere, which is why we can immediately continue with our next conversation, which will take place inside of the Med Bay, where we meet a familiar face. Commander Shepard. I watched the Normandy crumble with you on board. It's good to see you alive. And two easy Paragon points can be had for selecting the topmost dialogue option here, so let's do exactly that and learn how the Doctor has found our way over here. I'm shocked. You're serving on a Cerberus vessel now? Surprising. Even to me. Yet, here I am. The kind of trauma you endured would have changed most people. But not you, I see. Welcome back, Shepard. And just like before, we will also ask her if she needs anything. After all, helping out an old crew member, that is the least we can do. Do you have everything you need? I believe so. This medical bay seems very much like the sick bay on the original Normandy. Only thing missing are my private reserves. I even had a bottle of Ceres ice brandy that I was saving for a special occasion. And yes, that doesn't sound like a big task, so we can definitely promise to get her another one. I'll keep an eye out for a replacement bottle. Oh, you needn't. It's expensive, and we have much larger concerns ahead. Time to ask a few more questions now, and because she was a loyal member of the Alliance for a long, long time, it should be interesting to hear why she left all of a sudden. Doctor, you've been with the Alliance for years. Why leave now? After the Normandy was lost, the surviving crew was reassigned. I was stationed at the Mars Naval Medical Center. A very respectable position, but it wasn't on a starship. Colonial military life isn't for you? I've spent most of my life on warships, never knowing what the next mission might bring. I'm used to the hum of engines, the creaking of bulkheads, that subtle vertigo when the momentum dampeners kick in. Life planet side is just too static, too boring. It still seems like a huge step from leaving the Alliance to joining Cerberus, so maybe she can also explain how that all happened. You're not the Cerberus type, Doctor. I don't work for Cerberus. I work for you. On a mission that may be crucial to the survival of the human race. I have faith that your dealings with Cerberus will be ethical. I trust you, Commander. Now, her trust is well and good. Still, I think we should mention that even if the Collectors are not working with the Reapers, we are facing a pretty dangerous threat. There's a very good chance this mission will be a one-way trip. Are you prepared for that? I've been through the reclaiming of Shanxi, the Skillian Blitz. We survived the Battle of the Citadel and the destruction of the Normandy together. I've lived a full life. No regrets. I'd like to make sure the crew gets the same opportunity. And that is certainly a noble attitude, showing us that she is deserving of that brandy, should we get our hands on it. I'll see you later, Doctor. Commander. Access to the AI core is restricted. What's this area of the ship? The sick bay. It is equipped to provide short-term emergency care. In the event of critical injury, personnel must be transferred to a fully equipped medical facility. Alright, and that concludes our business on the cruise quarter stack. So we are now heading over to the elevator, which will bring us down one more level. Down in engineering, we can get a quick codex entry from examining the monitoring station, before Edie then can tell us a bit more about the deck itself. What's this area of the ship? Normandy's cargo deck. It includes facilities to rearm and repair Normandy's embarked ground vehicle and shuttle. My last ship didn't need a shuttle. Why do we have one? This ship is nearly twice the mass of the previous Normandy. 
it is more difficult to land the ship on high gravity worlds. As you can see, the doors here to the side can't be accessed at the moment, so we now head into the back of the ship. The stairs on the side here will also leave those be as there is nothing down there right now. Instead, we can head further into the back and talk to two of our engineers. You came all the way down here to see us? You're speaking to our commanding officer. This time we have the choice between Paragon and Renegade points. However, after two and a half episodes of favoring Paragon, the choice is an easy one, so we'll go with the Paragon option once again. I'm touring the ship, getting to know my crew. I'm Engineer Ken Donnelly, handling the power control systems. This is Gabby. That's Engineer Gabriella Daniels, actually. I'm responsible for the propulsion systems. What can we do for you, Commander? And also, once again, we are going to turn that question right around. Maybe there is something we can do for them. Are you set up okay down here? We can't complain. I just wish it didn't take so long to calibrate the FBA arrays. Kenneth, you're complaining. Well, let's go down that path. It should come to no one's surprise that we will receive another small assignment here. What kind of problems are you having? When they upgraded the Normandy design, they got a bit sloppy with the FBA couplings. I won't bore you with the tech, but there is an array of attenuators in the primary power transfer system that channels the field bleed. Kenneth, you're boring the commander with tech. In short, if we had T6 FBA couplings installed, it'd save us a lot of maintenance time each day. Why isn't something like that already installed? It's probably just a design oversight. Efficiency isn't affected, it's a maintenance issue. Also, the T6 model can be hard to find. Nash and Stellar Dynamics discontinued them. We could probably find used ones in the Omega markets, but we have no time for shore leave. Now, once again, we are going to Omega anyway. We might as well keep an eye open. On to the questions now. And of course, it would be interesting to know what kind of qualifications our two engineers bring with them. Where did you receive your training? Both Gabby and I started in the Alliance, serving on the SSV Perugia. She flew in the first wave at the Battle of the Citadel. We saw Sovereign firsthand. So the two of them were also with the Alliance. It seems like we have quite a few former Alliance members on board. Why did you leave the Perugia? After you died, that weasel Udina backslid on the Reaper menace. They discounted Sovereign as an isolated threat, as a single- Which was bullshit. They said your warnings of a greater danger were mistaken or delusional. We lost respect for Alliance leadership. We need to fight the real enemy, and only Cerberus seem to be doing that. Okay, that right there was certainly an interesting piece of information. We haven't really heard much about how Udina is running things, so that might certainly be something to keep in mind. What do you think about Cerberus? Actually, we don't know much about the organization other than the Normandy team. We know our mission and who's in charge. We're off to kick the collectors right in their daddy bags. That's enough for me. Definitely not the most elaborate motive, but if it works for them, I won't argue. And let's wrap things up here by learning how exactly the two of them joined Cerberus. How did you wind up with Cerberus, Ken? Once you were gone, the Alliance brass descended like vultures, tearing apart everything you'd said. I was very public with my defense for you. I didn't hold back. That's an understatement. If Kenneth wasn't such a talented engineer, they'd have court-martialed him for insubordination. But it got me noticed by the elusive man. He made an offer, and here I am. And I assume for Gabby, the story is a similar one. So why did you join, Gabby? Kenneth and I have been partners in crime since we graduated from Tech Academy. When he got the Cerberus offer, I insisted that it include me. He'd fall apart without me. Thanks, Mum. Also, I love engines, and the Normandy is state of the art. When I got the opportunity to work on her, I had to jump. Alright then, looks like we're done here as well. But of course, we will visit these two again soon. Carrier. Will do, Commander. I'm amazed Shepard came down to see us. I told you he would. What's this area of the ship? This is main engineering, which contains the ship's main fusion plant and Mass Effect core. So this concludes our business on the engineering deck as well. We have received another small assignment and two more Paragon points. And we can now head back to the elevator and for the first time make a stop in our captain's cabin. What's this area of the ship? This is the commanding officer's quarters. It's larger than the quarters of other warships I've served on. This is a Cerberus vessel, not an Alliance warship. Accommodations have been made for personal taste. That said, this space is directly under the exterior pressure hall. The fitting yard workers called it the loft. Right, we have another private terminal over here on the desk. That is the same one as it is below near the galaxy map. We can also have a look at our achievements here, which we don't want to do at the moment. And also on the desk, we can see a picture of Shepard's love interest, which is of course Liara. 
the fish tank on the side here, that will actually play a role later on in the game. For the moment though, we can leave it be. Just like the armor locker and the sound system, we don't want to make any changes at this point, so really our only option at this point is to head back to the elevator, and with that, back to where we started, which is the combat information center. And here we can now have one more short conversation with Kelly Chambers. Earlier when we spoke, you were very open with me. I like that. But I hope I didn't come across as too flirty. I don't want to overstep my bounds. Well, we certainly did our best to flirt with her, and actually I would like to continue down that road. This does not lead to any kind of serious romance, at least for the time being, it's just a bit of flirting and not much more than that. You're very charming, Kelly. Thank you. The feeling is mutual. Anyway, how may I help you, Commander? And that was also already all I wanted out of this conversation. That'll be all. I'll be here if you need anything. Alright then, and with that I would say we have reached the end of another long episode. I had hoped for it to be a bit shorter this time, but apparently our crew likes to talk a lot. So in the next episode we will then open up the galaxy map for the first time, and we will also see a bit more action as we continue the game's main questline. Until then, as always, if you like the episode then please leave a thumbs up, and if you want to support the channel then feel free to subscribe if you haven't already, or you can also join the growing list of patrons and support the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.